Eight years ago when I had my own son who was born profoundly deaf with developmental disabilities, I was struggling with my own anxiety and stress and worries just on that hamster wheel of life. That's when I turned back to the science of psychology and behavioral sciences because I remember learning in graduate school about acceptance and commitment therapy. Not only was it beneficial for me to connect to my purpose and to my pain and build those resilience skills, I was able to find this greater purpose beyond me, which is coaching individuals and helping them navigate through their own challenges. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Through Help and Back. We are so happy that you're here. I'm so happy to be here today. Uh, we've got a lovely day. It's, it's late in the year, uh, but the weather has turned for us, Ian, and, and life is good, and we're enjoying everything. So how, how was your walk in, Ian? Did you enjoy it? Did you have a good time today, or were you feeling the effects of that heat out there? It's a very shocking walk, actually. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, I was well, inside for a second. I was looking out the window. And it looked nice, but you know, you can't really trust the weather here in New England. It right. looks nice sometimes, but it's really cold. But yeah. today, you know, it was it was really nice. I wasn't fooled today. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's this is the bring a jacket capital of the world for sure. Because yeah, but not today. It's gonna change any second. So mm -hmm. no, it's great. And it is that time of year, and it's actually what one of the reasons I'm really excited for our guest today, because as we talk about winding through the fall, transitioning down to the end of the year. We've got holidays coming. We've got all kinds of fun stuff. And everybody's always thinking at the end of the year, you know, they've got resolutions that are coming. They've got their goals. They've got their plans for the next year. And we have somebody today who just lives and breathes that stuff all day, every day. She is an expert at helping people with their values, uh, anchoring to values, and looking at trying to align those values to goals. Uh, Dr. Loria Cho is with us. She is a board-certified behavior analyst and a personal development coach who really focuses on the behavioral sciences and translates that uh, to help people out in their day-to-day -day life. So uh, Lori or Dr. Lori, I don't know. We'll start with Dr. Lori, then we'll get comfortable and call you Lori. But Dr. Lori, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. You can call me Lori. All right. We're already there. That's how you build rapport, Ian, right there. There's, there's uh, therapy 101. So yeah, so it's great. You've got, the, you've got the yellow jacket. You've got the bright colors, a bright smile. You've got some sun in the window. You must be in a, a very nice part of the world today. Where are you? Southern California. I mean, if I had to guess, Ian, if you had to look at that screen and guess where Lori is, you would say Miami or Southern California, like without a doubt, right? Like that's, that's the vibe for sure. So yeah, so cool. How is life in Southern California? I heard it never rains there. It's beautiful. It's nice. I can't complain. No complaints here. Yes. Very blessed to be in Southern California. I'm a golfer, so even better because I the weather allows itself to for me to go out and play golf. A golfer. So I'm gonna say something that lets you that makes you think I know something, and then I'm gonna prove to you that I know nothing. So what is your handicap? Thirty one. Yeah. So and now what does that mean? <laughs> it means I'm not good. <laughs> How do you, with your busy, like incredible, like, I mean, we're going to talk about this. We joked about, I really need like two or three podcasts with you because we've got the behavior analyst stuff. We've got the personal development and the coaching. And I want to learn all about that. But how do you, I mean, golf is a, it's not a half an hour thing, right? So how do you find time to, to get engaged in that and balance all that out? I think you just really make time, honestly. And, um, you can play nine holes. So you have to play all 18 holes. So just actually on Tuesday, I have a taco Tuesday golf crew. We played nine holes. We found a course that, uh, got lit up and we have our <laughs> glow balls. And so we still make it happen even in the evening after work. Uh, but you just, you got to make time. Well, good for you. I got some buddies at golf and I feel like they come back more stressed than when they left. So it sounds like you're out there having fun. It's a mindset. It's a total mindset. Yes, I am definitely out there having a good time. Let's dive in because, you know, we've had a lot of guests on here that have kind of like this professional experience and then a lot of people who have kind of this personal experience and there's this kind of line developing in the field between, you know, therapists and psychiatrists and behavior analysts and coaches. So tell me a little bit about your background and what brought you into both worlds because I haven't met people that have lived in both spaces. Oh, that's a great question. So my background is in psychology, what with an emphasis in behavior analysis. So 
uh, I utilize the science of behavior to maximize the potential for people, really optimizing well-being and optimizing um, just the people to thrive and have better vitality uh, in their lives. So I found this love and passion for the science as it pertains to uh, behavioral therapy, working with children with developmental disabilities. But then I really pivoted in maybe like nine years ago, eight years ago, when I had my own son who was born profoundly deaf with developmental disabilities. And I was struggling with my own anxiety and stress and, you know, worries and just on that hamster wheel of life. And so that's when I turned back to the science of psychology and the and behavioral sciences, because I remember learning in graduate school about acceptance and commitment therapy, or, you know, in the space that I'm in, acceptance and commitment training, which are these six processes rooted in mindfulness and values-based behavior change. And I started to embody that, uh, learn it, go to workshops, uh, really incorporate these strategies into my own life. And then I started to reap the benefits. And then I really found my love and passion for uh, coaching and speaking and making sure people have these same tools and strategies, uh, despite any, um, you know, challenge or anything that they might be going through. These strategies are very relevant to optimize our well-being, um, get us connected to our purpose and just help us to be more resilient in life. It reminds me right off the bat of the the kind of old Steve Jobs comment about looking back on your life, all the pieces will fit perfectly, right? But going forward, you don't really understand why you're being led the way that you're being led, right? It's like, why am I being taken in this direction versus that direction? But now at this point in your life, looking back, it's like, oh, well, this makes perfect sense. This all connects. Oh, it makes 100% perfect sense, yes. And it's really getting connected to finding purpose through our pain, you know, because what's on the other side of our pain and what we care about is what matters to us. And so not only was it beneficial for me to connect to my purpose and to my pain and build those resilient skills, um, I was able to then in turn find uh, this greater purpose beyond me, which is coaching individuals and helping them navigate through their own challenges and just help them build more resilience and get them connected to giving them tools. Like even I was um, doing a coaching session this morning and my client says, okay, now I have a game plan. Like now when I'm getting caught up in my internal tidal wave and my storm, like I, I know to stop, to notice and pause but now I have a game plan on what to do moving forward that's aligned with my purpose, that's aligned with my values. And um, it's just great to help people get connected to that. Purpose and the pain almost feels like a mantra. You know what I mean? It feels like something you could like recite to get through those tough moments uh, and refocus uh, because that's, uh, that's Nietzsche, right? He who has a a why to live for can deal with any how, right? So you're dealing with this overwhelming pain, but if you have a why, if you have an overarching purpose, a foundational belief in what you're here for, all of a sudden you can get through it. You can find strength in that. Right. Absolutely. And sometimes we don't have control, right, over our circumstances or what life throws at us. And it's just how we choose to respond, like the, the Victor Frankl, right? Like how we choose to respond to those circumstances, to those situations and find purpose and meaning through that. And you know that better than most. So tell me a little bit about that transition because you were a helper, a researcher, you were in the field. Then you dealt with a situation that you were not in control of. I mean, I wonder what that shift from the person who gives help and who, you know, researches and understands to a person who needs help. Uh, what was that like on a personal level for you? That had to be incredibly difficult. It was difficult in the sense of I was hard on myself at the time, like, you're a doctor, you have all this behavioral training, and you should, right, be able to help yourself. And then interestingly, though, when I turn back to the science, because our behavioral science is very compassionate, I, I, I was able to reflect on, wait a second, I'm not broken. I'm not defective. Nothing is wrong with me. I'm a human 
going through a very real, raw, human experience that matters to me. And so what we know is that because we're human, we're going to experience, especially when it's so close to home and it matters and we care about it, we're going to experience the good and the bad and the, you know, all those, all those thoughts, all those emotions. And so because I have this philosophical understanding of that, I was able to give myself compassion. I was able to step outside of my thoughts to, to view it as we call verbal behavior because our thoughts are, you know, behavioral condition responses. And I was able to, in some ways at that early stage, have a different perspective to detach. Okay. Let me step outside of my thoughts and really look at what am I, what is, what am I really struggling with? Oh, okay. I'm really struggling with this idea of, I thought motherhood was going to look like this. And it's not. So we call, you know, looking at that gap, the reality gap of the reality of what I wanted and the reality of what is. And then noticing, stop, stopping to notice what's showing up for me in that gap. Your training feels like such an asset in this moment, right? Because you've got that foundation to go back to. What are some of the mistakes? Or I don't want to call it mistakes because that's kind of labeling. But what are some of the pitfalls or the missteps that people take? Like where does the average non-trained person go emotionally or psychologically in your experience that keeps them stuck in those difficult moments and, and stops their progress to the other side? People don't realize that their behavior serves a function. So when we're looking at from a behavioral perspective, we're looking at what is the function of your behavior within the context and within your instructional history. So we're looking at a person's history, we're looking at a context, and we're looking at what is the function of this person's behavior that has been reinforced. And our context and external variables could reinforce, but we also reinforce those behaviors as well. And so when we are not really looking at it from that angle, we inadvertently reinforce these behaviors, which may be moving us away from our values. It may move us away from a rich, full, and meaningful life. It moves us away from being present in the moment. It might move us away from, you know, being able to have intimate connect, uh, connections or be present with people in a way that's meaningful. So it, what I do is I really help people to look at the behaviors of what's keeping them stuck, of what's keeping them or preventing them from embodying a rich, full, and meaningful life aligned with their values, aligned with what matters. We look at the function of that and we we help people to take perspective so that way the function no longer, you know, we kind of call it, we transform that function. It no longer has so much weight. It's no longer in the driver's seat, like the person is now in the driver's seat. And we recognize that, okay, I'm going to bring that with me, right? That's a part of me because I'm human, but it no longer has to be driving my behaviors. It no longer has to serve that function anymore. And I can create a new uh, way of being as it pertains to uh, that issue or whatever the situation is that they might be going through. I like that imagery of getting back in the driver's seat because I think people hand over their keys all too quickly to their feelings and their emotions, right? And so you hear things like, well, that's all well and good, Lori, but he pissed me off or she hurt me or this happened to me. And now, I mean, I'm feeling this, like I really do feel it, you know? So like, this is a very like, it feels kind of analytical and that's great once you have like your wits about you in your head. But in this moment, like I'm feeling hurt, I'm feeling angry, and somebody else did that to me, 
and I, I don't know about your experience, but my experience is almost like they have this default setting where it's like, so there's nothing I can do about it because this is what you did and I'm not in control of that. And this is what I'm feeling and that's real. So I'm, I'm just along for the ride. And what you're saying is no, 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 you don't have to go along for that ride. There's options. There's three things. So one is to stop and notice what the trigger is and what's showing up for you. So stopping to notice what it's raining and it's triggering me that I'm in a bad mood because I can't go golf. Right. You know, something so trivial. Right. Like, all right, all right. And so and so now it's stopping to notice what's showing up. But then maybe I have a story around that. Right. Like, oh, um, I can't go golf and now I can't do this. And now I and so we keep going on and on and on. We call that a relational network where um, nothing works out for me. Life's so unfair to me. This always happens. This always happens to this me. This always happens. I'm, and, and, and I, what do I make that mean? I make that mean I don't matter. I'm unworthy. And so now we go on. We, and, and, and then we're like, and it's just the rain, right? We, the trigger was the rain, right? But then it's like, okay, that's an opportunity. See, I see these as opportunities to explore and notice what that narrative, what that, what's that commentary, what are the thoughts that are easily just being triggered because we have this conditioned history with them. We have a relationship with them. We have, me, myself, I have reinforced that. And so, and, and so it's really stopping to notice that and then also stopping to feel that. Where do I feel that in my body? What what does that experience feel like? You know, and then and then it's it's getting connected to what truly matters to me. How can I move forward in a way that's aligned? And it's amazing with humans how a subtle reframe from, you know, I I have to versus I get to or problem to opportunity. That simple little act of reframing that speech. I've seen that put people on a totally different trajectory, right? And so the easy example is like, it's the end of the day, I'm tired, I'm kind of tired, I still have to work out. And you're like, oh, damn it. And you drag your butt in there and you kind of go through the motions and, and you get nothing out of it. But it's not because you had a bad workout, it's because you came in with the expectation that you weren't going to get anything out of it. You said, I have to do this. It's, it's a box I need to check versus that person. And, and sometimes they're like an obnoxious person, right? That person who's always on and they're like, yes, I can't wait to be here. I get to work out. And it's like, yeah, but you're kind of coaching yourself and you're changing that story around the activity, right? The working out didn't change. It's just how you approached the task. And, and working out is a very casual example. It can be something as serious as dealing with a child with a, with a disability. It can be something as serious as job problems or health problems. Um, you know, so subtle reframes, I think, are ways to get back in that driver's seat, like you said, and start a cascade that change your entire experience. It's, a, it's amazing how a little change can have such big results down the line. It really does. It could even be as simple as I choose to be present even though I feel, I don't feel well, or I don't, I'm experiencing anxiety. So for example, like somebody asked me, like, how do you get up on stage and speak? Doesn't that make you nervous? I'm like, yes, but I can still choose to show up. I can still choose to be engaged. I can still choose to be present despite this uncomfortable thoughts and feelings that I'm experiencing. So take the person in the gym. It's not necessarily like you have to psych yourself up. It's getting connected to why does this matter? Why am I here? You know, and I might, I might not feel like it, right? I don't feel like being there, but why am I connected to uh, this action, to this behavior in a way that's aligned with a bigger picture, bigger purpose of what of my, my values are, what I stand for? I was working with a, a CEO and uh, just to give you an, another example, like she, she was, uh, she was very much like, I want to be the best, but constantly feeling disappointment. Right. And it's like, and that versus I want, I choose to be present to show support. I choose to be present, to be fully aligned. You see the difference in just uh, being the best versus 
being present, just even changing that. It's like, okay, that's more aligned with there's going to be fires, there's going to be issues. How can I still choose to be present and fully support? And, and, and versus um, what is the best? That's so, it's, it's, it's a, we want to be more objective in how we can show up and, and measure that. And I like what that choice implies. Again, it, it, the choice, even saying I choose, implies that you ultimately are in control. You ultimately have a choice to be able to be made, right? A victim can't choose. That's what defines them as a victim. But if you're able to still make a choice, even if it's a choice to be present, which I love that phrase, like you don't have to be great. You don't have to have your best workout. You don't have to be the ultimate CEO. You just have to be fully present and engaged and and you will show up in that moment if you can get there, you know. Um, but just that start, I love that presupposition of you're the one that does the choosing. It's It's so subtle and beautiful. I love it. And it's through feedback, the feedback loop that helps us to modify and change our behavior. So, I mean, going back to golf, imagine if I went out and I just started playing two years ago and I'm like, I have to be the best, right? I would, I would have shut down and stopped playing like a, a year ago, but I, 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 I just choose to show up, to be present, to, and then, and then when I'm present hitting the ball, or maybe I don't hit the ball, but it's the feedback that I'm getting that shapes my re- behavior, right? And and so it's it's just it's a, again it's a mindset of how we show up. And best is an ex- is usually externally reinforced, whereas choice and being present is internally monitored, right? Nobody can look at you and say whether you're really here. I mean, I'm looking at you right now, Laura. You seem fully engaged. You might be thinking about golf later. You might be thinking about your son. You might be thinking about, you know, what's for dinner. I don't know. Right. So it, choice and being fully present is an internally validated state of mind. Whereas best, it's like you're waiting for somebody to show up and give you a medal. And so all your power is out there. Somebody's got to reinforce that. You, you just really can't declare yourself the best. So there you go. You're giving away more power all along the way. Right. And waiting for that day when somebody says, oh, the best CEO ever, you know, uh, that's tough. Listen, I, you, I want to shift gears a little bit because you talk a lot about purpose and being aligned with your purpose and connecting to your purpose. Uh, is, is, is a person's purpose found or is it created in your opinion? Like, do we have to discover the purpose we are made for or can we create and develop our purpose? Oh, that's a really great question. I, I think that's, um, it, it, I think our purpose is always evolving because we are always evolving. We are always going through different seasons in life. And as we go through different seasons in life, our values and our purpose can also change as well. So I think it's really about getting connected to what season am I in? And in this season that I'm in, what matters to me and how do I want to show up? How do I want to embody those qualities, those characteristics? You know, when I ask my family members, when I ask my colleagues, when I ask people around me that matter, how am I showing up? You know, they validate, am I truly aligned with my purpose? Because it's one thing to, to say, yes, these are my values. This is my purpose. This is how I want to show up. But then are my actions aligned with that? And am I getting that feedback from the people that matter to me? Like, yes, you know, Lori is showing up aligned with her values of being present, of empowerment, of motivation, of mentoring, of um, being a coach. You know, those are some of the values right now and my purpose that I'm embodying in this season in my life. That wasn't necessarily my purpose 10 years ago when I was having kids and I was a new mom and navigating my son being deaf. Like I had a different purpose then. I like that. I like that a lot because it feels like something we've said on here before about, you know, when you want to change your internal state, you know, your actions will do a whole lot more in terms of acting your way into a different way of feeling than feeling your way or thinking your way into a different way of acting, right? So I think people sometimes get lost on this search for their purpose as if they're going to turn the right corner on the right street, you know, in the right city and go, boom, I found my purpose. But I I find that people often leave that process kind of disappointed and still wanting. 
And so it made me wonder, I wonder if purpose is more created or found or discovered. And it sounds like you're firmly in the created camp. Like, you know, you can go out there and you can find your purpose through creation. You have to take those steps and those actions and then reinforce it through your story. And now you found your purpose and you're aligned. Um, I mean, and it's definitely a feeling too. It's getting connected to when I am most full of vitality, when I am at my best, like, well, they're the word best, but when I'm, when I'm, feeling yeah, okay. full, yeah, when I'm f- feeling full of vitality, I'm thriving, I'm fulfilled. I'm, I feel aligned. You know, there are certain words that you can ask and, and, and helping people and, also keep in mind that we might have different purpose and values like in different domains of life, right? So um, I might have a purpose and a values system that gives me vitality when it comes to my career versus personal development versus my health and well-being versus my marriage versus uh, me being a mom. So I really, I'm a firm believer in getting connected to our values in each of those areas that are important to us, because that's really what's going to give us the rich, full and meaningful life versus oftentimes people are like, I know what I want and who I am in my career, but then they are missing all the other pieces in their life, you know? And, and I think that's, you know, how do I cultivate joy? I cultivate joy by um, cultivating connections outside of work and that might be golf or that might be networking, you know, and people go, Oh, how do you find time for that? But but that's part of an area of life that brings me fulfillment and vitality and joy. And that trickles and pours into how I show up as a mom, how I show up as a wife, how I show up as a boss, a leader. Um, So those areas do matter to also connect our purpose how do purpose and values sort of play together? Like what is the relationship there and how do you help either yourself or your clients, you know, define those values? Cause if I Google, like if I just Google values, right, I'll probably get 500 different words, right? So tell me a little bit about that interplay between values and purpose and how you help your clients define specific value sets. I really get them connected to what matters to them. How do they want to show up? What do they stand for? How do they want to be remembered? Uh, When they are full of vitality, what does that look like? What does that feel like? How do they connect to that? Um, You know, another way to connect to values is kind of looking at maybe some regret. Like, oh, I regret, you know, being checked out as a mom, you know, well, what's on the other side of that is my value, what matters to me, which is I, I want to be present. I help people get connected to their values and your values don't have to just be um, like one, right? You could have multiple values and there's no right or wrong to it. See, that's the other thing too, is we have a tendency again, because we're conditioned to want to judge, to label is this good? Is this bad? Is this right? Is this wrong? Sometimes I even did a workshop one time and a lady, she got connected to her values. And I asked, I posed a question. I'm like, okay, now are these truly your values or are they influenced by outside sources? And, and she was like, wow, I just realized I, these aren't even my values. These are my parents' values just passed down. And so here she's thinking like, oh yeah, I'm living my values. But when she really got connected, she's like, this, these really are not my personal values. So it's, it's helping people to, you know, get connected to their values. Um, and, and also a big one is people are really good about creating goals and getting connected to goals because goals, there that's a final destination. That's an outcome. But, it, you know, when I was uh, teaching one time and um, I had my students do this and one of my students said, I want to lose 20 pounds. And I said, well, why? And he's like, he looked at me. What do you mean? Why? Because he goes, I, I need to lose 20 pounds. And I, I go, I know, but what's your why behind that? And so when we did more of the diving work into values, he realized he's like everybody, every uh, male in my family 
passed away young because of diabetes and heart problems. And he's like, I want to be a dad one day. And so I know that in order for me to live a long life and to be full of vitality and energy and to show up as the dad I want to be for my child, I have to be healthy. And so when he got connected to that, it was like, oh, wow. So now when you're in the gym and you don't feel like being there and you don't you don't have motivation, it doesn't feel like, yes, I'm going to go to the gym today. You go back to your why. You go back to your value around that. This matters to me because I value longevity. I value health. Well, and what you're talking about there is I, it wanders into an area that I'm really kind of passionate about. And I don't have great answers on this, but I think about it a lot is this issue of identity, right? So you're talking in, in terms of purpose and who you want to be and how you want to show up in your life. But I think about identity and I think that humans have this, I don't know what, what word, a compulsion. <laughs> uh, desire doesn't feel strong enough, like compulsion to prove us right. We want to prove ourselves right. And I feel like there's nothing stronger to the brain than to be able to say, I knew it. Um, good and bad, right? So if you think you're a loser and you've got that internalized, you can, I believe you can stack up all the best behaviors in the world and say, do these things. And they will find a way to bleep it up, to fail so that they can go back and reinforce that internal state and go, I knew it. I'm a loser because losers lose, right? And winners win. And I don't mean that in like the macho, like alpha male nonsense way. I mean that in the sensitive, empathetic way of you've got to be careful of the stories you tell yourself and the identity you form for yourself. Because if you get to a place, like I'll use your example, I don't know this guy, but he sees himself as a dad before he's even dating, right? He will, he will act like a responsible father will act. And then as a result, will become that. Right. Versus if he sees himself as lost or cast aside. And so I love where your purpose, if you if you keep walking down this road, I think we're going to end at a place where purpose connects with identity. And I think that's the the rocket fuel that drives all of this, because I think a plan is great. Uh, I'll use Ian as an example. Ian's like the greatest planner in the world. This dude's like schedule is like to the minute. You know what I mean? And like he's literally gotten up in the middle of things and been like, no, it's 815. So now I'm exercising and like start running like he's on the schedule. You know what I mean? And that's cool. And you can execute. But I also think that sometimes that can be like a drag because you're like you're checking boxes. You're not living a life. Whereas if you're like, I'm this guy, I feel like the behaviors will follow that identity pretty closely. Have you have you seen the same? Oh, yeah. I like to use the word flexible persistence. Okay, so you're persistent and you're accountable and you take action. Okay, but it's flexible, flexible persistence, because uh, we know that psychological and behavioral flexibility is going to optimize well-being and keep you moving. It's when we're inflexible, it's when we're rigid and we're narrow, that's when we have a tendency to be hard on ourselves, to be our harsh critic. Or like you said, we start finding evidence. Oh, see, I'm a loser. Oh, see, I'm not good enough. Oh, see, I, you know. So it's really being persistent in taking actions aligned with our values, but with flexibility. Before we go on, I want to say a few words about a new behavioral health. A new behavioral health is an outpatient provider of mental health and substance abuse services in Ohio and New Hampshire. That means that a new can successfully treat mental health and substance abuse issues or dual diagnosis if you're struggling with both. Their integrated approach allows for them to successfully address issues related to anxiety, depression, addiction, trauma, and really anything that stands between your life and the life you could be living. You really cannot bring them an issue that they have not successfully treated. They have also solved one of the biggest problems for people seeking help. They have a dedicated team waiting to hear from you at helpnow at anewbh.com. If you contact them today, within 24 hours, you will have heard back from wait for this, a real live person, and we'll also have your first appointment scheduled at that time. 
So how do you contact them? Well, if you're in Ohio or New Hampshire, you're probably close to one of their local locations. You're welcome to go in. If not, you can always reach them online at anewbh.com. And if you're interested in services for you or loved one, use that address, helpnow at anewbh.com. It seems you like to coach your people or, 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 you know, work with people on giving themselves some grace and some forgiveness, right? Like it feels like a lot of what's showing up in your language is like, give it your best. But when you fall short of maybe you're like, don't beat yourself up. Like you do not have to drag yourself through the dirt in order to like move closer to your goals. So I'm hearing a lot of that. Yeah. Because it's not if you fall, it's when you fall. It's not if you uh have a road, hit a roadblock. It's when you hit a roadblock. So it's already preparing for the external and the internal roadblocks that are going to show up for us. And so how are we going to ride the wave? How are we going to navigate through that? Because what happens is people are, don't expect for that. Like, oh, um, I'm going to, I'm going to like, just kill it. And I'm just going to go after my goal. And okay, that's, that's great, but what's going to happen when you start getting in your head? What's going to happen when you start experiencing self-doubt? What are you, how are you going to navigate through imposter syndrome or anxiety or the, that stress? You have to have a plan to flexibly also navigate and move through that. And that's what's going to create that resilience. So when you say resilience, uh, I was going to ask a different question, but you said something much better. So we'll go with that. When you say when you say resilience, you're you're just talking about that flexibility. You're just talking about the bend but not break, basically. Correct. Yeah, you know, you know, have a tough day, but show up tomorrow. Yeah, and it's one thing to say, okay, I'm going to demonstrate resilience, but I teach people how. So I give them mindfulness tools, mindfulness strategies. I, I help them to get clear on what is going to be a roadblock for you in your career, in your health and wellness, in your relationship, in, in your personal life. What's going to be that roadblock? And the acronym is FEAR. So F, fusion. Like, are you fused with these thoughts that you believe to be true, but are not? You know, E, yeah, are you are you uh, escaping? Are you um, avoiding? Are you um, turning s standing turning for towards substances? Things that are like okay, I'm just gonna inadvertently reinforce when I feel the self doubt or the shame. Now I'm gonna escape that because I don't want to be with that, and I'm going to reinforce that by just shutting down, avoiding or trying to problem solve it or fix it or, you know, so that's going to give us that temporary immediate relief. But in the long term, it reinforces that narrative, that story, that commentary. We don't even realize that we do that. But that's what as humans we do. We want to seek immediate relief. And then our remote is are you are you remote from your values? Is your goal remote from your values? Like I said, that one guy, you know, if he was like, I'm on a mission to lose 20 pounds, but not connected to his why, that's what's going to probably, you know, prevent him from being flexible and persistently, you know, continue on his mission. So it's giving people those mindfulness tools to, okay, can you stop, notice what's showing up for you and engage in leaning into that, creating space and room for it. In acceptance, this is the other key too. In acceptance and commitment training, people think acceptance like you have to like it or want it. No, that's that's not what that means. Like I don't have to like or want the rain or I don't have to like or want, I, you know, even the challenges that come with having a son that's deaf with dis- developmental disabilities. But I can choose to accept And have a willingness and an openness to be with what is. And do that from a place of curiosity. Okay? Do that from a place of non-judgment. And just be open to having a willingness to be with that. Be with the external situation, even though it's out of my control. And even be with my internal emotional state. In emotional uh, 
storm. And even that sometimes is out of my control. Why? Because I'm human and I have an instructional history of engaging in that behavioral response. So that's the part where it's really giving ourselves that kindness and that compassion to be with that, you know, because we're human. I love that framework. Is that yours? That comes from acceptance and commitment training. With the people who engage in this, because it's so funny, because we listen to this stuff and like I'm listening to it, I'm, I'm nodding along. I'm like, this is great. Like, I love this. I'm like pointing at Ian, like clip this. I want this. I'm going to use that later. Like, that's so good. But I think a lot of times clients, they come in and they, they have that experience where like what everything you're saying sounds good. And but I've been in this cycle for 10 years. Let's just make it up. You know what I mean? And I know you have clients that have cross that bridge and are on the other side and are living more fulfilling lives and have adopted this mindset and are making it work for them. Do you see any key differences between, and I want to use my words carefully, but do you see any key differences between the ones who are able to make that transition to a more fulfilling experience versus the ones who stay stuck or fall back into old patterns? Like what are, in the most simplest terms, what's the difference between the ones who make it and the ones who don't, I guess is what I'm wondering. I think the biggest key difference is the accountability. So accountability to yourself. And sometimes if you don't have accountability and that integrity to yourself, you might need an external, a community to support that until that accountability becomes fluent as a behavioral response or behavioral repertoire. Because either either way, without accountability, you'll continue to fall back into old patterns or old behaviors. And I know you can engage in coaching and, you know, yeah. developmental processes. Do you, I feel like you're a big accountability guy. Do you think accountability is is helpful in that way? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, accountability also applies in therapy because you're seeing someone on a consistent basis. Um, I'll give you an example just from recently and being transparent here. I have started, you know, getting therapy just to see, you know, different ways I could improve. And um, I've been taking way more action because part of the therapeutic process is, okay, what's your ideal life? And this also applies to coaching. What are you going to do to get there? Why is this important to you? When are you going to take these steps Mm. by? Mm -hmm. So by next week, I'm going to have X, Y, Z in place. Um, And it's so great too to have another person helping you with that because you're not taking on too much, but you're also pushing yourself just enough to start Mm. taking action. Mm -hmm. And it's going to make a difference within weeks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's an important factor too, especially in the world we live in, is understanding to give yourself the grace and give yourself some time. You know, Ian's talking about, hey, it's made a difference for me in a matter of weeks. Um, But I do think sometimes people leave before the miracle happens. You know what I mean? They sort of bail because they're used to like the way it's been. And it's like, you know, the devil you know versus the devil you don't, right? And it's like, it feels like it's taking forever. Like, when is this ever going to change? And actually, when you get into a therapeutic process, it can actually be more difficult to start because you're facing all of these things that you've been coping with through the escape mechanisms that you described. And so um, that's kind of my big advice for everybody involved in that is just keep showing up because uh, a couple weeks for a lifetime of dysfunction is not a, a heavy price to pay. But sometimes those weeks can feel like forever. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, when is this ever going <laughs> to... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in my ideal class, like right now I'm coaching and um, I do eight weeks. So this isn't like a one session. A one, and I like to give them exercises, experiential exercises and tools and strategies. And I make it very tailored and individualized to them and to their situation. I think that's where it resonates and it lands because now they're doing experiential exercises um, as it pertains to like their own personal struggle um, versus it being very broad and you're, 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 you're not, it's not, it's not connected in, um, in a way that's meaningful. So that's where we have to really get our clients connected to what matters, what's meaningful, what are they struggling with? Why? And like I said, what Ian said, what is your ideal life, um, look like, and how are we going to take those measurable actionable steps so it's not just taking action, but it's taking action that can be measurable. So there is accountability 
and ultimately eventually accountability to themselves where they can start to see. Um, you know, I even told my, my client, I said, ask your staff, um, did I show up present for you today? And versus like being the best. And, and I'm like, that's an actionable, measurable step that you can take to get feedback that your staff are telling you, yes, you showed up present. Maybe the problem wasn't fixed. Okay. That's not the point because there's, as entrepreneurs, we can't fix every problem, right? Those, those problems will be there, but did I show up fully present and fully aligned to support in the best way that I could? It's such a clever intervention because she's going to get such positive feedback on that because, you know, think about your boss coming and saying like, hey, I know we're still working on the problem, but I just want to make sure that you felt like I was engaged with you today and I was present with you. They're going to be like, man, this, this is awesome that she cares enough to, you know what I mean? So it's such a great feedback loop that's in place there, you know, because just by virtue of doing that, you're going to become more present by asking the question, you know, I mean. And yeah, now, yeah. now it's not only sh- she's holding herself accountable, but now her staff are going to hold her accountable, like to be, and again, the idea isn't, are we, are we fixing the problem? It's, am I showing up present? Very manageable and within her control. Um, tell me a little bit about this. Uh, I know with your background and, you know, behavior analyst and now in the coaching, I mean, we talked off camera and you have a real passion for the coaching aspect of this now. So can you tell me a little bit about like, that transition and why you love the coaching so much and maybe how your former life informs your current life and those two kind of play together? Oh, that's a loaded question. Mm. <laughs> that's a good one. It's getting late, Lori. I'm trying to drag some stuff out of here real quick before we go. You know, honestly, um, I love the coaching aspect. My ideal client um, is they're just stuck. They don't really have a game plan. They are not clear on their values, you know, in certain areas of life. They have not taken the action aligned with the values to get that feedback. Um, Maybe they're struggling with um, not being able to be fully present and engaged because they're so wrapped up in their commentary and their, their thoughts or their narrative, their story about themselves or the situation. So they're maybe struggling with some stress, um, burnout, anxiety, and that's moving them away from the person that they want to be in this lifetime, or it's moving them away from the ideal life. So for me, it's really helping people get clear, you know, gain clarity. So get clear on purpose gain more peace in their life and to become more present essentially. So optimizing well-being and more vitality. And I, I'm able to do that in a, like an eight week coaching uh, experience. And I use that very individualized and tailored. I even have a pre and a post. So when they start out, they can see like how, you know, maybe how inflexible or how rigid or narrow, like they're, they can see it's very clear to them, even in the first session, like, oh, this is why I feel stuck. This is why I feel like I don't have a lot of vitality and peace in my life. And then I, you know, in eight weeks, they'll see, okay, my, my, my flexibility score went up because I was able to address those six areas for them in terms of uh, well-being and vitality. I think that's so key because a lot of the the healing arts are exactly that. It's a, it's a little bit of art to that, right? It's not so much scientific. And I know you have that scientific and research background. So to quantify all that is really helpful. It's almost like the simple version of that is like, you know, you go to the gym, here's the picture on your first day, here's the picture on your hundredth day. You, you know, you may feel like I'm not making much progress, but if you can take a look back and see just how far you've actually come, that can be very encouraging, you know, because even if you're feeling the ups and downs still like, no, no objectively, you've made some real progress here. And at there's this saying, like, the goal isn't to make you feel better. You know, it's just to help you to feel. So oftentimes clients will come and they're like, get rid of the anxiety, get rid of the stress, get rid of the, and it's like, that part of being human. So basically you're saying, I want to not be human. <laughs> so it's just giving people the tools on how to effectively manage that how to effectively navigate through that. 
It's almost meditative in a sense, because if you think about any guided meditation, there's a lot of encouragement to notice what you're feeling and then to let it, to, to let it pass by and let it move on without getting stuck in that or, to, or too distracted and to do it in a non-judgmental way. Right. So, you know, I'm sitting, and also compassionately explore it from a place of curiosity about what it might be revealing to you too. That's true. Yeah. What is this telling me? Be all behavior as a form of communication. So what am I communicating to myself or to others through this behavior? Yeah, that's good. Uh, Laura, on a personal level, I mean, again, you've got great energy. You've got the knowledge base. I mean, are, is this just you? Like, is this who you've been your whole life? Or have you been like, have you ridden the waves as well? Have you had your, your non-productive moments? Because you seem like, you know, I mean, multiple careers and you're doing, I know what you're doing and then just your energy. It feels like if I was a client sitting across from you, I might feel like, oh, well, she's got it all figured out. And so, you know, I'm just totally different than her. But I mean, has this been something you've used personally as well? Oh, 100%. And thank you for bringing that up because I do think oftentimes uh, people go, oh, she doesn't have any problems or she doesn't struggle or she has a PhD and she might have it all together. And that's so far from it. I utilize these tools every single day. It's truly a lifestyle for me. Um, You know, even when I was asked to do a keynote uh, for a convention, I, you should have seen me like the week before I I was having all these thoughts and why me and why, why, who's going to listen to me and, you know, just the, just those thoughts of getting wrapped up in my head. Um, And then I, I had to go back to my own tools and strategies that I coach and do that for myself. And okay, Lori, you're, you know, experiencing the thought that you're not good enough. That's what you're experiencing. Can you be with that thought? You don't have to accept it. Like, I'm not saying that I want it or like it or it's part of me. I'm just noticing as a human, I'm experiencing that that is a thought I am having. And that thought is influencing or, you know, producing this anxiety that I'm also physiologically feeling in my chest, the shortness of breath. So now I can... Instead of, I like to call it, it's like instead of being in your movie, you step outside of your movie. Yeah. So I go through this all the time. You know, I have those moments, um, even as a mom, you know, same thing. You know, I had a, a, a episode last night, in fact, with my kids. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, and it's just learning to ride those waves, to take, take a deep breath. I had to like give myself a moment, you know, go to the bathroom, like, <laughs> And, and lean into, like, lean into that. Like, it's okay to lean into just because, you know, oftentimes, like, for me growing up and being raised um, in this, like, very strong Mexican household, we're like, oh, just be strong, right? Like, that's what we're taught. Just suck it up. Be strong. And I made that mean as a kid, like, I can't feel. Like, you're not allowed to feel. Feeling is weak. Feeling is bad. So there we go. We want to judge it. We want to label it, Right. And so um, then I have this very real raw moment as a mom, you know, and, and my boys and, and, and my babies and, you know, they're, you know, he's born, he's born profoundly deaf and, and going through navigating through all that. You know, that I'm allowed and I, I want to, I need to give myself permission to lean into and create room and space for those feelings that show up for me. Because that's part of feeling, you know. So again, in act, it's it's not about feeling better. It's about learning how to feel and to be with that in a way that's that's compassionate, um, but also effective in how we turn towards those feelings in a way that aligns us with greater purpose, meaning, and our values. I don't know how somebody would. Uh, certainly not in a healthy way, but you know, not to be dramatic, but I don't know how somebody would survive or navigate those challenges. Also carrying around this internal idea that you're not allowed to feel any of it. I just think that that is a recipe for an ulcer. That's a recipe for cancer. That's a recipe for a panic attack. That's a recipe for, you know, what's that, that old meme? Like you're going to have a bad time, right? Like you're going to have a very bad time. Um, if you have to carry all that around and face all that with the message from your childhood of suck it up. Don't feel it. doesn't matter what you feel. Yeah, just do the next thing. That's incredible. That's a burden. 
Dr. Stephen Hayes, he's one of the founders of ACT. Uh, he has a TEDx talk and he talks about this experience and he's this professor, researcher. He literally has a, a panic attack, an anxiety a, a, attack. And, you know, again, it goes back to, he's like, oh, I, 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 I had to go back into that little boy and give him what he needed, you know? And it's, Again, recognizing that because we're human and because we care, we're going to feel. And what, essentially what we're doing, if we don't allow ourselves that permission or space to feel, we're, we're neglecting, like we're, we're neglecting ourselves, right? And we would never, I would never tell that to my son, you know, I would, I would be there for him. I would, I would comfort him. I would nurture him. And, and oftentimes we don't tend to do that for ourselves. So, um, you know, that is a big part of also the coaching work that I do is this compassionate work. Um, and how are we showing ourselves that compassion when we need to give ourselves that grace and, and time and permission to, to honor what shows up for us? Well, I appreciate you, you going into depth on that and sharing that. I, I've talked on the podcast before, like, you know, my experiences of being the therapist, working eight, nine hours a day and helping people with their problems and helping people with their anxiety and depression, and then pulling over on the side of the road and having a panic attack on the way home. I mean, I went through that for, you know, for quite a long time. Um, you know, that's measured in, in, you know, months, if not years, not days. And so I always love the human aspect of people who are in the helping professions because, it's like the Wizard of Oz. If you pull back the curtain, it's just a person. You know, it's just a person back there. And and that's great because we can feel what you feel and understand what you feel because a lot of times we have been through the same kind of stuff. But I, I, I mean... I, of course, we're professional and we're polished and we have, you know, a nice waiting room and comfortable settings. But I love to rip down all those walls between like that and reality. It's like, no, this is just one human to another. We know what you're feeling. We felt the same stuff. And, and I can back you up on that. If you want to feel uncertain or feel like, you know, and you want to have some highly emotionally charged moments, go have a couple kids and have, let them run around your house <laughs> for 18 years. You're going to feel some stuff. You know what I mean? And it's, it's so funny because, you, you know, the PhD, they don't, they don't care. You know, the, the professional accomplishments, they don't care. You're just mom and they don't want to hear it, you know, and they're going to challenge you and all that good stuff. So yes, 100%. You know, and I'm not an expert in the physiological, but I mean, I, I, we know too, when you're not, when you're harboring and you're not, you know, uh, releasing and, and, or, you know, it's going to manifest in, in your body. Like you're going to feel it, you're tense or, you know, losing sleep or, um, you know, it's, 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 we do see that. I'm sure you see that as well. Just the physiological effects that that can have. It certainly doesn't help if you're running around with elevated cortisol levels and your adrenal glands are firing, you know, I mean, it's just, it's not a healthy state. It's, it's driving your car by hitting the gas like this over and over and over. Uh, that car is not going to last very long and our, our bodies aren't much different than that. So, um, yeah, so, so we're getting close. I do have a couple more questions though before we go. Um, I know that every client is individualized and obviously a lot of this comes down to like get involved with a professional, get a proper assessment. But if somebody's listening to this and, and they're feeling like that client you talked about where they're just not really landing, they're not really connected to purpose. Do you have two or three tips to kind of get them started? Like what is something that people can do today uh, to, to start getting more connected to their purpose or to start dealing with that, not feeling aligned like you talk about? Is there a way just just sort of some general general steps to start the process? Yes, 100%. In fact, I met with my team and we were looking at, wow, we're already in November. We're almost the end of the year in 2023. We looked back at our goals, you know, and we were noticing, oh, okay, um, where are we at in terms of those goals and what what's the vision we want to create for 2024? So um, I think for listeners who are looking to 2024 in terms of uh, what is that vision going to be for 2024? I think really start with looking at the domains of life. So your career, your, or might, maybe it's education. Like if you're in school, looking at your, you know, leisure, health, well-being, you know, what's fostering joy for you. Um, looking at your relationships. It might even be spirituality. It could be, um, you know, your family, your, your values as it relates to family. So I like people to get connected 
to their values and to their vision, not just in career, because we're human, right? It's looking at those different life areas. And then simply ask yourself the question, what matters to me in this life area? How do I want to show up? What are the qualities and the characteristics that I want to continue to strengthen and embody? How specific should they be when they're answering these questions? You know, again, it's values are a way of being and doing. So it's just about, I mean, you could have a ton of values, you know. So, for example, I might go in my career for 2024, I really want to, you know, continue to be a mentor, transform lives, be present. I want to um, be supportive. You know, these are just different values of what I, what, how I want to live, how I want to embody those qualities about myself. So when I ask the people I work with, they will come back and report, oh, yes, you were present and supportive and a great mentor and a great, um, you know, you, you, you did embody those qualities and characteristics, you know, or as a mom, you know, my, maybe as a mom, I might get really clear on like, I, I stand for love. I want to be, I want to embody being present. I want to, I want my sons to feel like their mom is available and reliable You know, these are qualities and characteristics that I, so then you get clear on your values and the different life areas, and then your goals and your actions can be specifically more aligned with that. I like that a lot because I think better, sometimes we just come in, I want to feel better, you know, and it's like better, better is not really a goal, you know, Um, you have to have some type of structure to that. It doesn't have to be like exact, exact. And like you said, there's a lot of flexibility. I like that term flexibility that you use, but, um, and, and writing your goals down is so powerful. I don't know what's going on there, but there's all kinds of research that if you write them down, you're more likely to achieve them. It's just across pretty much across the board. Yeah. We call it like a see, do correspondence. So you see it and you do it. And now there's a reinforcement loop of the correspondence of the accountability and integrity, right? So it's, I'm going to, I'm going to say it, I'm going to see it, and now I'm going to do it. So simple, right? I'm going to say it, I'm going to see it, I'm going to do it. Honestly, that's confidence is when you are reliable and accountable and having integrity with yourself. You start, when you start to embody that, I say it, I see it, and I do it. That's going to really build that for you. Put them where you can see them. Like I said, I mean, put them on your mirror in your bathroom. Uh, I have a whiteboard. I'm not much of a planner, but uh, I have a whiteboard at home, and I touch it twice a year. I, put, I have different projects. I have personal, and I have my, you know, my businesses and things like this. And, and uh, I, I put my, you know, I, I literally will wipe the board. Okay, 23 is gone, and I put check marks by everything I did and didn't do. And I wipe it clean and then I do it again for 24 and then it sits there and that poor whiteboard gets touched like twice a year because I do it. I organize at the end of the year and I, and that way, you know, I don't have to stare at it. I don't go down in the morning and like recite my goals or, you know, chant them or anything like that. But every time I'm working in my office, it's right there and I can look, okay, it's a little reminder, a little reminder keeps me on track. And, um, I just think, I don't know, I don't know the science behind it. I just think there's real power in writing them down and keeping them in a conspicuous place even just for yourself, you know, just so you see it. So in behavior analysis, like we would call that an antecedent intervention. So an antecedent is like, it's, it's not after the fact, which would be consequence of what uh, feedback or reinforcement. Um, it's antecedent in terms of like arranging the environment that sets the occasion for the behavior to occur. So that's basically what it is, is you've arranged your environment the verbal stimulus, the textual, the written word to occasion a response, to occasion the the, the thought or the, the, to say it, to see it, and then to do it. So we call those different antecedent like 
interventions or antecedent um, uh, manipulations or variables, but we can arrange the context to occasion us to engage in that, the, the likelihood of that behavior is going to occur and therefore they can be reinforced. So that's, again, as behavior analysts, we're looking at all those ways in which we can continue to strengthen and shape our behavior towards a values-driven life. See, Ian, and you thought I put my wallet by my keys just because I was forgetful. I was doing an antecedent intervention. Did you know that? I was because <laughs> <laughs> then I'm more I'm more likely to grab my wallet and I won't lose my wallet and, and I won't be ticked off all day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we got to uh, increase the probability, and that's again. So on a on a very last note, it's like again, people will take it. So people will take it personal, right? Like I am forgetful versus. As a behavior analyst, we're like, okay, what env- what's the environmental antecedent intervention that can occasion the behavior to occur? Ver- so does that so see the difference? It's are you you're 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 you're, you're taking a situation and you're creating meaning out of it, and, and 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 versus no meaning has to be created out of that. You just have to set up the right intervention, the right context, the right variables to occasion your behavior to engage in that. Ian, I need you to clip this five minutes and send it to my wife immediately because uh, I'll, no more will I be called forgetful or any of that other stuff. It's like, no, we haven't set up the environment to occasion the behavior to happen more often. I mean, that's all it comes down to. Just take somebody who doesn't do something and they, now they're going to create meaning and say, I'm a loser. I'm a failure. I, I forgot. I always, forget. I always forget. I can't keep track of shit. I always lose everything. Yes. That's just yes, who I yes. am as a person. That's my identity. Bring on that shame. Yeah. I got to beat myself down here a little bit. Right. Yep. So as a yep. behavior analyst, as a behaviorist, I'd go, well, let's look at the environmental arrangements and contingencies. What have we done to occasion the behavior to occur that can then be strengthened and reinforced? And so now that you take the person creating meaning out of the situation, it's like, it's not about you being a loser. It's just about you need a ver- a, a, a textual verbal reminder, maybe, you know, I don't, you know, so no, I, lo- I love what you're saying. I love it. It, it, it works in what, so kind of inside baseball, but like this is, this is all, all, all Skinner stuff, right? And so it's like a modern version of Skinner. And sometimes when people think about BF Skinner behaviorism, they, they think about the pigeon spinning in circles and they think about the box that you put the baby in. And they're like, this guy was a tyrant. He was cold and he was unfeeling. But there's actually a lot of forgiveness and there's actually a lot of grace in behaviorism because it, it prevents you from internalizing these things in terms of like my inborn deficiencies that just are just, I'm flawed. Well, you don't even have to play that game with yourself. You don't have to feel that way. You can just talk about, you know, actions, consequences, stimulus response, and you can set your environment up for the results that you want, which will then allow you to feel better about yourself on the back end. So, um, I I mean, I've been doing this a minute, Lori, and I'm thinking about this in an all new way because of what you shared today. This is really good to hear. You know, so I love what you just said, because that was literally my keynote address. My keynote um, speech was exactly what you just said. Like our science is a compassionate science. And this is why. And exactly what you just said. It's, It's truly when I went to graduate school, I had a whole new lens of that I was looking through because I'm like, well, I have a whole new way of viewing life, viewing people, but more importantly, viewing myself. That was a game changer. Yeah, you were off the hook. You were off the hook. You weren't, you weren't, you weren't bad. You weren't anything negative at all. You were responsive to your environment and that gave you the power to change it. And then, yeah, I love it. I love it so much. Um, and how lucky, right? How lucky because it, people don't really know this, but like based on the programs you go to, unless you're like an advanced student, which you probably were, but I wasn't, you, you were kind of a luck of the draw in terms of what those programs focus on, right? Like my program was very solution focused. So we let it, we spent a lot of time with Insu Kim Berg and Steve DeShazer and, and Brad Keeney and those types of things, right? So your lens that really clicked for you was this behaviorist lens. If you had gone to TCU with me, you wouldn't have gotten it. You would have gotten one class and you would have gotten one chapter in that class. All right, go review BF Skinner, come back and tell us all the things you hate about him and you'd move on, right? And so it's just so, I think it's funny how life works, right? No accidents that you found that and it's changed your entire reality. And not only that is I love taking the theory and the philosophy of the behavioral sciences and bringing it into the personal development coaching space. 
that's power. That is so powerful because I, I, I think that's what makes me unique as a coach is that I'm bringing this philosophical way of thinking, a science, and bringing that to my clients to empower them and to give them more compassion and to teach them these strategies um, from that angle, from that lens. Lori, what's what's next for you, career wise, personal wise? What, what what's what's next? What's on your board for the next year? Well, I'm in the process of writing a book, of so course. that's of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you give us a sneak peek? What's the what's the book going to be about? It is a combination of a personal like memoir of my journey, but uh, giving people the tools and strategies rooted in psychology and behavioral sciences, specifically ACT, acceptance and commitment training. And I, I share it in a way that's digestible, giving examples, um, just personal examples of what I have also been through in in my journey. So that's uh, my goal for 2024. It's a big goal for me. Um, And just continuing to, um, I do speaking engagements. I love uh, doing workshops, working with companies and organizations. Um, I love, love my, my jam is my eight week program, working one-on-one with clients because I get to get very individualized. um, And I really enjoy doing that as well. So that's really what's next for me. That's awesome. I can't wait to read it. You got to you got to let us know when it's available and, uh, you know, give the show. We'll give it a plug once it's out and available. I'm, I, I mean, I, I mean, we've talked a little bit. I mean, I know it's going to be great. I mean, it seems like you're you're really in this space right now where you're aligned with your purpose and the things that you're getting involved with have this energy behind them. And I'm sure that the book will be no different. So thank you. Um, thank you. Appreciate amazing. That. It's, it's a pre congratulations. I know it'll be great. So thank you. And uh, getting my handicap lower. I was going to say, you stole my, you stole my <laughs> joke. I was going to say, get into those 20s. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's so interesting? My, actually, a, a goal for me is I do want to, um, on my bucket list, like I love traveling and I love taking my clubs. So I love um, playing golf courses in different terrains and different areas. So, um, yes, I'm, I'm going to work on getting a lower handicap and You'll be seeing me out there on those golf courses. I can't wait to say, yeah, well, get get up here to New England, bring a rain jacket, and we will absolutely maul your handicap because the wind and the rain, I mean, it, you'll just be, you know, you, you walk left and right across the course more than you walk up and down because it's, uh, it's a challenging thing here, which is why I stay away from it. So, uh, Lori, how do we find you? How do people connect with you directly and how do they find more of your content and, and follow what you're doing? Yes, thank you. So I am on social media uh, at Dr. Lori Ochoa and uh, have a website, drloriochoa.com. And I think that's the best way to, to connect with me. I love it. I love it. So we'll wrap with that. But I am so appreciative of your time, Lori. It was so great. Um, I really meant what I said. I mean, as I'm sitting here and, and trying to be present with you and thinking about these things, I mean, these are concepts that I've had bouncing around in my head for 20 years. And, you know, you kind of pick your style of working and it really has caused a reconsideration. And I'm going to go back and, and reread and kind of look at some of this stuff because I really like how you've humanized some of these behaviorist concepts and translated it to a place that is actually very loving and forgiving. And I think sets the stage for a lot of success. Um, when I first encountered behaviorism, it was very dry to me. It was, you know, one plus one equals two right? Here's the pellet and the pigeon spins in a circle. And it was like, oh, people aren't like that. But you know what? There is some humanity there that I missed um, that I need to go back and reconsider. So I I really want to thank you and and sincerely appreciate your perspective and the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Thank you for sharing that. That really means a lot that you said that. So thank you. Carry that message. You're doing a great job with it. So, and for you guys, and Ian, thank you as well. We're going to wrap up here, but thank you for sharing, you know, your experiences with therapy. I know that we've gotten a lot of feedback that people are, are, are connecting to, to Ian when he steps in. We got to get another camera on you, man. You've got the, you got the hair and the beard going. People haven't seen you since you've got hair back. So we got to get the camera on you and, uh, <laughs> and, and get them back in touch with that. And for you guys at home and, you know, watching in your car, whatever, doing podcasts. Oh, Lori, let's see the book. Let's see it. I, I just, I realized I had it right here. I, I taught this was a whole course in grad school, I, but I, I taught it to graduate students uh, about a year and a half, uh, two years ago. And I love what you said. It's just it's it's truly coming from a place of 
of compassion and really making a difference to um, just, yes, I love what you said. I, I don't want to take the words out of your mouth, but because uh, I'll feel like I'll butcher it. But just exactly what you said, it's, it's just a, a truly compassionate science. And you won't, you won't butcher it. You'll make it better. And so you take those words and you run with it because uh, whatever stumbles out of my mouth, I mean, I come from a place of sincerity and that's really what I was feeling listening to you. So um, I wanted you to have that feedback just because it does, it does get the wheel spinning and it does cause a reconsideration. It makes me think that I missed something there. And, you know, we're all in this to help people. And, you know, we're all in this, especially with social media and things like that, to balance out this negative self-talk in this world that's kind of like sending us constant messages that no, never enough. You're not good enough. There's always something lacking. There's something wrong with you. And if you buy this, you might feel better about it, right? So I really like anything that helps offset that. And I, I guess I just missed that. And where behaviorism says, no, no, you're good as is. And we can just work on these other factors to help you get the results that you want. You don't have to beat yourself up before you get yourself into this better life. I just, I don't know. I'm seeing it through new eyes. And I think those are yours, Lori. So I thank you for providing that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so check it out. We'll link to the book and then Lori will send us her, her link when she starts selling those books um, or giving them away, whatever you plan on doing. I'm not sure, but we'll, we'll link that to the episode. And I do want to express appreciation as well. We always wrap uh, thanking the audience, uh, wherever you're listening to this time is your most valuable asset. You've spent an hour in, 15 minutes with us. And that, that's a huge chunk of time. And so I just appreciate you so much. And, and I hope that you're, you're encountering these concepts the way I am with, with fresh eyes and with a new thought to what behaviorism, uh, ACT and things like that can do to help connect you to your purpose. It's not just about, you know, do this and get a better result or one plus one equals two. You can connect to purpose and really get in touch with the best version of you and why you're here. Uh, and that's kind of what we're all trying to do with all these different modalities is why am I here and how can I have the best ride and the best journey and connect to my purpose while I'm here. And so uh, Lori's opened our eyes to a new way to get there. And I hope you guys will take the time to investigate that. So uh, thank you again. Um, and until that time, until next time, uh, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks so much. Hey guys, although Through Help and Back is an excellent podcast with a lot of great ideas, I do want to let you know that in no way is Through Help and Back expected to be perceived as or relied upon in any way as specific medical advice or mental health advice for you personally. The information provided through Through Help and Back on our website or our podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment that can be provided by your own providers. Do not use our content in lieu of professional advice given by qualified medical professionals and do not disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking professional advice because of the information you have read on our website, heard on our podcast, or otherwise received from us. Although we love discussing issues related to healthcare, mental health, and addiction, we are not providing direct healthcare, mental health care, medical, or nutrition therapy services. We're not attempting to diagnose, treat, prevent, or cure in any manner whatsoever any physical or psychological ailment, any mental or emotional issue, disease, or condition. We are not giving you specific medical, psychological, or religious advice whatsoever. Please take care of yourself and take care of others as you always seek the advice of your own medical providers and your own mental health providers regarding any questions or concerns you have about your specific health or before implementing any recommendations or suggestions from us. These are ideas that have worked for other people. We think it's important to share them. We do not guarantee that they will work for you specifically. Do not stop taking any medications without speaking to your physician nurse practitioner, physician assistant, mental health provider, or any other healthcare or medical professional. And if you have or suspect that you have a medical or mental health issue, contact your own healthcare provider promptly. Also, one last thing, if you know or suspect that you are currently experiencing a crisis, it is absolutely imperative that you seek the advice of your doctor or other emergency healthcare services prior to ever thinking about using our content. We love the conversations. We're glad you're stopping by. We hope you take a lot from the content. But again, for your specific individual medical situation, please always seek quality personal care from your own providers. Do not let this uh, information or this advice stand on its own. Thanks so much for listening.